Hello? Hello? Just want to interrupt this smooth jazz. Hi, um, my name is Jonathan Billings. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little about uh, running um, Fedora Workstation at scale, which means running it on lots of computers. Um, I'm, I've been a sysadmin for a long time. Um, been working at universities, now I'm at Red Hat. Uh, I manage the internal uh, uh, corporate standard base, which is what we call our spin of Fedora. Um, and uh, we've been using Fedora for about a year now on our employee laptops. Let's see. So I just want to talk about a couple things about how you would manage Linux at, uh, workstations at scale. Um, there's, I'm going to start off by what exactly you can actually manage uh, instead of having to go through and configure each system individually. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the problems that you encounter whenever you're trying to manage, particularly laptops at scale. And then I'll have a couple final thoughts. So uh, Linux workstations, they're just Linux. They, they're very similar to Linux servers in that there's packages, there's files, there's services. You can run commands. And a lot of the tools that you can use to manage Linux servers can be run on Linux workstations. And so in many ways, we're just going to be doing the same sorts of things, pushing out packages, pushing out files, managing services. Um, so whenever you're manning, managing a workstation environment that's going to be deployed wildly, widely, you're going to need to be able to provision them in a regular way. Um, there's a, a lot of system-wide configurations that you can deploy that will uh, allow you to manage the desktop environment. Uh, those are deconf, uh, browser settings, software repositories, and just like user capabilities. Um, I'm going to go through a lot of these things in my slides, and I might have some examples in here in my slides that will be like JSON files. I just have those as an example. I don't expect people to read them, and uh, my slides will be available later if you want to look at them closer. Uh, so whenever you're provisioning a Linux, uh, I'm sorry, Fedora workstation, I definitely suggest you use the uh, Kickstart environment that uh, Fedora has. Anaconda is amazing, and it does a lot of great things. Um, we uh, use it for setting up partitioning automatically. We use it to set up an initial kind of package layout. Um, and then, you know, stuff like timestamps, or I'm sorry, time zones and things like that. And then there's a post install script that's in the Kickstart that basically bootstraps the system and gets it so it goes into our uh, setup tool. Um, I have a very customized ISO that I create, and uh, I use the, uh, the MK, MKKISO, or make KSISO, I don't know, uh, command to add the kickstart file to the ISO command. And then I also use uh, Lorax to build a live image. And that basically is kind of like a tarball of an installed system. And that gets put on the ISO. And the advantage of using that over having a bunch of packages on your ISO image is that you can make it a lot smaller. It doesn't need to have every package that's available to Fedora, just the ones that you want to have installed. Some suggestions, definitely you should, if you are managing laptops at scale, encrypt the disks, because they do tend, laptops do walk off. I'm sure there's going to be some at this conference that will wander off. You'll be happy that you have it encrypted. Um, Anaconda actually has support for creating an escrow file. Whenever you partition your disk, you just need to put a, a certificate on the ISO, and it will use it to create a, a, an escrow uh, backup key for your uh, Lux encryption, and then if you then later pick up that file, then you can use that to, ha uh, if someone forgets their Lux encryption key, you can use that to decrypt it. Um, also, definitely make good, uh, use good naming conventions for your laptops, if you're, especially if your logs are going into a central log location. Being able to say, Joe's laptop, <laughs> is doing something bad, you definitely need to know what that is. So if you're using Splunk or Elasticsearch or something like that, it's definitely good to have good host naming conventions. And also definitely try to automate everything as you can. So the first thing I want to talk about is deconf. Deconf is basically the, uh, a key value-based system that's used by a lot of tools, including GNOME. Um, you can just kind of look at various things with the deconf command. This is how you look at what the, the default background picture is. Um, there's just like a URI, and then you can actually 
examine all the deconf uh, settings for the screensaver there. Um, you can uh, manage system-wide deconf settings by dropping files in slash etsy decon. And this is actually really useful because you can also lock them. So if you've got a policy that says, oh, you have to have your screen lock after 15 minutes, you can set it there and then lock it. And yeah, if you've got root on the system, you can make that go away. But this is more of a kind of like being able to set to the system defaults is very useful. Um, also, the GNOME Display Manager, it takes advantage of deconf. So you can do things like set a background or uh, make the little icon in the bottom be something special. Or, uh, you know, if you're, if you're managing, uh, uh, like, like I am, a corporate uh, desktop image, you can make it so there's like a little warning text on the screen that says, you know, this should only be used by um, people who are at Red Hat or something like that. Um, Firefox. Firefox, you can, you can do a lot of site-wide configurations for Firefox. It has uh, a directory that you can drop files into. I believe they are, all, they are JavaScript files. Um, and you can set things like the default home page. Um, you know, there's a million different settings on there. Um, I use it uh, for, oh yeah, and setting default spell checkers, proxies, network settings, something like that. Separate from the default preferences, you can also, there's a policy language, which of course is not, it's JSON, and um, it lets you do things like set uh, default preference, or default settings in Firefox, which is different somehow than the default preferences. Don't get me started, there's a lot of different things that you can do with it, but one of the things there, like I have the deploys bookmarks, but more importantly, you can do stuff like deploy default uh, Firefox extensions, for example, if you want to have it so it install, automatically installs uh, uBlock, it will do it for you. In addition, you can customize those browsers extensions. For example, I mentioned uBlock Origin. Um, it has its own special um, policy that you can then include in the policy for your Firefox. So you can even point it at different filters and things like that. And a lot of extensions have these settings and they're really poorly documented. I'll just tell you that much. uBlock is really good. Their website actually describes how to do all these things. So go to their website. There's even a policy file checker that you can paste your policy into and it'll tell you whether it's valid or not. Um, Chrome also lets you define settings uh, with a JSON file. And this also is true for a lot of the Chromium-based browsers, so like Brave, and I can't think off the top of my head of other things, Vivaldi. You drop the same file in the right direction, it'll get read in and it'll be used. Uh, for example, my setting here, you might want to look closer if once I show the slides, that turns off all the AI features in Google Chrome that try to get started up whenever you start Chrome. And trust me, it starts up its own TensorFlow um, if, you don't, <laughs> if you tell it not, uh, unless you tell it not to. So, super fun. Um, and then, you know, Chrome has its own policy language that looks a lot like the Firefox policy language, but it's distinct in its own fun way. So, um, for example, you don't give the extension name, you give this weird thing that's called CJPALH, blah, 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 blah. And that is the UUID of the browser extensions in the Chrome store. But it lets you do stuff like tell it to install it automatically or uninstall it. That's another nice thing you can make it do. Um, and yeah, it looks like Firefox policy. So moving on, uh, obviously if you've ever done anything in Fedora, you've probably seen YUM repository. So it's always a good idea if you're managing systems, have your own YUM repository so you can push out your own packages. Now I admit you should definitely, if you've got something that's worth putting into Fedora, become a Fedora packager and put it into Fedora. But sometimes you've got things that you have to distribute that can't be put into Fedora. So having your own RAM repository, repository is really nice. However, we're talking about laptops. And these are laptops that are sitting out there on people's desks in their home, in the coffee shops and stuff like that. So it's not always that good an idea for you to have your YUM repository just sitting out there for anyone to be able to add to their system. So one of the things that you can do is you can password protect it. YUM supports this uh, username and password that you can put on, a, on it, and it just it's standard HTTP authentication. Um, you can also make sure it's only available inside your network and stuff like that, so they'll only work if you are connected to a corporate or a university network. 
So to move on next, uh, user authentication. A lot of places it's really difficult to manage users on workstations because if you're not sitting in a corporate environment, you might not have the ability to talk to Active Directory or Kerberos or anything like that. Um, so yeah, you could always deploy out password files and then figure out a way to get those password entries deployed out in a safe way. Um, one of the things I definitely suggest, uh, Fedora uses SSSD. Um, it has a caching ability, so you can you sign in once while you're connected to Active Directory or Kerberos or LDAP or whatever, and then from that point forward, it will just use that cache um, and you won't have to be connected again. And the, next, the nice thing is, is if you're actually connected another time and you type your password, it'll refresh the cache. So if you change your password, you, well, you just plug it into the office network and try to log in and it'll use the new password. Um, you know, Fedora uses sudo by default. Um, everyone has sudo if you are setting up an initial workstation because it uses the wheel group and most start users uses the wheel group. But this is a thing that you definitely want to manage if you are managing a fleet of systems because not everyone really should have sudo ability. I mean, at Red Hat we actually give it to all of our users, even the people who are just sitting there using it as a worst processor because frankly we trust our users, but you might not. I used to work at the university, I didn't give students sudo on our workstations. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, kind of adjacent to sudo is policy kit. A lot of tools within Fedora will use policy kit to determine whether you're allowed to use, uh, run things. Systemd uses it, package kit uses it. Um, it has a configuration language, rules, and I believe it is, is it JavaScript? I don't remember what language that is. JavaScript. Yeah, JavaScript. Um, it is a little bit dense, but it, it has a lot of nice features. Like, for example, you can say, oh, well, people who are sitting behind the computer can run this command, but if someone's SSHing in as that user, they can't run this command. So it, it's pretty useful for that way. Um, remote support. Okay. I have not found a great open source remote support tool. If you're a sysadmin or help desk person and you need to support someone, I've heard Rust, Rust Desk is very popular. I've not yet used it. At Red Hat, you use, you use Beyond Trust. It's not, yeah, Bombgar. Uh, it's not fantastic, it doesn't support Wayland. And so if you try to do a remote support session with someone running Wayland, you see a black screen. Um, unless they start some X apps, and you can see the X apps. Um, then there's TeamView and Adex. I don't use those, those are garbage, as far as I know. <laughs> I've used one of them, and it was one of the ones that got hacked, and it was not good. And then, of course, you've got SSH. Uh, I definitely recommend SSH, but SSH is not something you want to expose to the world, so you have to figure out how you want to do that. The way we do it at Red Hat is we Make it so it's on, but only if you're connecting through the VPN. So if you're on the VPN, you can connect to it remotely to do remote support. But if you disconnect from the Red Hat VPN, I can't connect to your system, which makes sense because probably your system's sitting behind a NAT in your home office or in a coffee house or something like that, and I wouldn't be able to get to it anyway. <laughs> so when you're managing them at scale, what does that mean? I kind of wanted to go into a little bit, I don't know how, many, how much experience people have with running a lot of systems. I know that Neil has experience with it because he's giving a talk on hyperscale um, Linux. Uh, but uh, yeah, whenever you're doing it at scale, there's, it just means that you've got a lot of computers out there and a small number of people who can manage them. Um, and so the philosophy behind that is the, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, it's cattle versus pet. You want to treat your computer as cattle and it's said pets. What do you, I mean, if you've got a dog, you're not going to want to replace it because something's wrong with your dog. You want to make sure the dog is happy and safe and healthy. But whenever you've got like, a, you know, a cow, if you've got a hundred cows out there and one of them is sick, eh, it's probably time to slaughter the cow and replace it. And that's kind of how you treat your computers. It's like, if there's a problem, just wipe it and reload it. Also, configuration code, you, that was like a buzzword for a long time. That just basically means try to keep all your management of your Linux systems as some sort of code, hopefully, in Git or what your favorite thing. Um, and then assessing risk at scale, I'll get into that later. Thank you. 
Um, there's a lot of open source, or I'm sorry, there are a lot of um, managed system products for Windows and um, Mac OS. Um, I've listed a couple things. These are not, uh, this is not an exhaustive list, off the, obviously. There's a ton of tools if you want to manage your Linux and Windows systems. But Windows and my, uh, Apple both have stuff built in that lets you kind of provision systems. And you know, Linux really doesn't have a lot of those things, especially not commercially supported. Um, and if they do support Linux, it's really not very much. It's like, run this shell script. And, you know, it doesn't, there's no like understanding of the deep of the system like you see with Mac OS and Windows. Um, there are a lot of tools out there to manage Linux that are open source, though. These are great for managing cloud servers and um, things like that, and they're usually managed by IT. And but it relies kind of like on this: you know everything about the systems that are there. So this is more for what we're talking about with. Uh, IT systems, and there's two basic philosophies on this. I'm just going over these because neither of them are really great for workstations. One is pull, and that means that the systems go out there and they pull configuration from a centralized server, and the other is push, and that means that the server is something that you run that pushes code configuration out to the systems. Pull systems require that if you're a system that's sitting out there on the internet, you have to expose the, the pull API to the whole world, and that means someone can attack it. And if this is something that's pulling down local configuration for your systems, you don't want to have this thing super easy to read by the rest of the world. Now, the problem with push has the same problem. How do you get to the system? How does you push this configuration? Like they said, there might be on a NAT. They might be turned off. It's just not something that's super easy to use. Red Hat uses Ansible for managing systems, so Ansible is a very big part of what we do at Red Hat, but is not perfectly ideal for managing workings, workstations. Like I said earlier, it's most, you know, most computers, when you're talking about tr traditional configuration management, their servers are cloud instances. They're, these are not workstations sitting on someone's desk. Um, it's always running. The network is usually static in some way. And um, you know they can always talk to infrastructure like Active Directory or, or LDAP or something like that. And traditionally, you don't have users walking up to them and randomly powering them off, which you do with workstations. Whenever you're managing Linux workstations, though, this is what it used to look like whenever you're managing Linux workstations. You know, it's just this office. You're in the office, there's a bunch of computers, they're all connected to the network, and they're basically the same as the servers, and they were treated basically as servers. Um, you know, everything was known about them. Uh, but now, you know, everybody's working remotely. You know, especially with the, the pandemic, we saw a massive surge of people who've been working from home. And honestly, I work from home employee, I know exactly what it's like, and uh, I don't really want to go back into the office. So this is something that needs to be solved. Um, there's a lot of questions. How do you manage these systems? How do you track them? How, can you even trust the network? Um, we don't know the network anymore. Um, as I said, people are on a net. You know, there's weird hours that are, people are up. Um, and then you know, laptops, they move around. They might be in your home. My laptop's now sitting on this podium. Um, you know, it's stuff like that. So, um, and, and I told, I actually, this is a duplicate side, but um, some of the other problems is that, yeah, they reboot. People like to tinker on systems and disable your management configuration. People plug in weird stuff, or they buy a new Lenovo that doesn't have supported hardware. <laughs> um, they get frequent firmware updates that might break their system. Don't see that as often with servers, but you did definitely see it with this. So the way we solved it here at Red Hat is um, I use Ansible. Ansible is uh, a really amazing thing to be able to manage systems. But uh, remember, I just said how Ansible doesn't work with the push. You can't really push to them. Well, what we decided is it was easier to just package up all the Ansible stuff and deploy it as a package. And then we have it as a, in a repository that's sitting in a cloud front location, password protected. And people download that as an update. And what it does is it has a service that runs its own uh, Ansible playbooks regularly. 
And then we have all the output being dumped out to Splunk. And Splunk is a very expensive product, and so I'm not expecting people to all use it, but it is a very useful thing. It has default support for it and everything like that. And then we also use OS Query, and OS Query is an open source product that basically lets us do stuff like monitor what, what packages people have, what uh, users are on them, and like, you know, kernel and stuff like that. So some final thoughts. Uh, yeah, Linux desktop management is still kind of piecemeal. There's a lot of different pieces out there. It just doesn't necessarily work as great. But I think that it's getting really good right now. Uh, don't be afraid to use commercial tools if you're interested in this stuff. There's still a lot of really useful things. I mentioned Splunk and uh, OS Query. Um, and then, you know, Linux, managing Linux users, as I say in here, they're an unruly bunch. They will break your system. Be surprised, or don't be surprised, it's going to happen. And to finish it off, there's a couple things I'd love to be able to try. I mentioned head scale and tail scale. I feel like a lot of this would be solved by a mesh if we could figure out a good way to do it and assign IPs out to general users. It's just not quite there yet. Um, and I've talked to Mark about this. I would love to be able to have it so someone could boot into their BIOS and deploy their system right from the BIOS. Uh, and that's something the cloud deploy should be able to do, but it doesn't. Um, and then the, I, yeah, I would love to, I've been watching this stuff about Boot C and OS tree based stuff. I think this is the, the future of workstations in the enterprise environment because there's so much less uh, overhead in managing them. And then I'd also like to be able to take advantage of OpenQA. Fedora has it, it's really useful. So, can I? Uh, why don't we do, there's a lot of people, so you, you pick. There's a break after this, so you can just come to me and ask questions yeah. afterwards, too. Okay, so one, two, three. With your systems, do you manage the configuration of UEFI and BIOS and firmware? Not entirely. We check to make sure stuff like Secure Boot is enabled. But um, the UUID stuff with getting uh, everything right is difficult. So no, we trust that Fedora does it the right way. Yep, OK. Uh, so you talked about um, the the private uh, the um, the remote assistance tools, and uh, there aren't really any the open source stuff. And look at the commercial ones. Um, Rustdesk is actually open source. It's an open yeah. source commercial solution. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, on the list of those, like Rustdesk and TeamViewer, they support um, Wayland uh, uh -huh. nowadays. Uh, there are a couple of others, and of course, both GNOME and KDE now have integrated remote assistance solutions um, for their environments, so those, awesome. those are also options. Um, but uh, the actual question I wanted to ask is, have you thought about um, moving from using install ISO or whatever to, like, say, a, a, a self-installing disk image that could then be either transmitted over the network with, a, like, a specializing USB stick or something like that? Um, for being able to do off-site provisioning or reprovisioning, because like I'm sure them remote users that are like at their working from home, they break their computer and they would like a really easy way to be able to reset. Do you have a process like that? I mean, you have an ISO that people can plug into the computer and boot from, and it'll, it'll okay. deploy a new. It it, it wipes the system, but. Mm -hmm. That may have gotten uh, to my end of it. How do you back up and or preserve user home areas? Uh, we pre-build uh, a configuration for DejaDoop to go against our Google Drive, because we have lots of space in Google Drive. And I have a tool that I wrote that is um, harasses the user until they set it up. <laughs> Perfect. A plus. Yeah. Harassment is the best policy, I swear. Yeah, yeah definitely. So uh, I think you're also in a unique position as someone who has supported a Linux workstation under RHEL and has now somewhat recently gone to Fedora. So I'm just curious, like, and given I know we're almost at the end of time, but do you have any like high level takeaways or lessons learned about how, what that transition was like? And were there, 
maybe one advantage, one disadvantage of going to Fedora. Right, right. Well, so uh, some little history, just uh, real quick. Um, we used to have RHEL workstation on all of our workstations that we deployed out to new employees and replacement systems. Um, and it was just recently, last year, switched to using Fedora. There were a variety of reasons why we made that choice. One of them was just, uh, as Mark mentioned, getting support for new hardware is much easier in Fedora. You know, um, we were actually limited what kind of laptops we could buy because it didn't, it, the support for it wasn't there yet in Fedora, or I'm sorry, in RHEL. Uh, but RHEL is doing a lot better, and I, you know, the, the whole six month um, trying to get everything into there is uh, an uh, amazing thing that I think that will probably make it worth doing RHEL in the future. But um, yeah, it was a lot of hardware support was the problem. And the other was, everyone was using Fedora at Red Hat already. I mean, <laughs> people are using it anyway, we're gonna support a managed version of it. <laughs> All right, so we are time out. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. And now we are going to have a refreshment break. Uh, for 30 minutes, and then we are going to be back at 4. Thank you. <laughs>